today we are on location at the Sedunka Junk Fishway and we are going to paint a little scene. Pretty much what's right behind me, but on the other side of that tree. So I'm going to show you what to bring, uh, how easy you can make it, and hopefully it inspires you to get outside while the weather's nice this fall and do some painting too. So let's go over to the picnic table over there and do some painting. I have my travel watercolor set here and it's in a palette by the Portable Painter Company. And the neat thing about this is that you've got 12 colors or 12 pans you fill with the colors you like. And the little case that comes around it is actually legs for the palette and holds water. So I'm just pouring some water from my water bottle. Um, since I have a clean and dirty water, I don't need to have a ton of water. I've also got some travel watercolor brushes, a gel pen, which I don't end up using, and a mechanical pencil. I have a couple sawn off um, flat brushes too. I'm working on Strathmore 400 series watercolor paper. This pad is six inches by 12 inches, and I already went ahead and taped down one of the uh, the edges just so I'd have a nice border. I'm doing a quick sketch of the um, of the waterway. Um, I just wanted to get some basic kind of a map of the scene out. I realize it's real light, but you'll be able to see the uh, sketch better as I start to paint. I just wanted to kind of uh, lay everything out so that when I went in with the watercolors, I wouldn't have to correct too much. Um, I don't like to put too many lines down, just a little bit, and I've got my trusty um, <laughs> painting assistant here with me. I'm going to start by wetting the sky area, and I typically don't work upright, but um, just to make it a little easier to film, I do have this on a little table easel, and I'm lucky that the area where I'm working has a painting table. If not, I would have been just kind of sitting on my bag that has a stool built in, and I'd have this on my lap. So um, do whatever's more comfortable for you. This is ultramarine blue, just on its own. Uh, there's such nice crisp blue skies with just a little bit of like a wispy white cloud today. Generally in the autumn you have bluer skies. I think it's because there's not so much humidity in the air. I'm also grabbing some of that color and putting it into the stream where I see the water reflected. Now this stream is actually, um, it's very marshy and it feeds out into a larger pond which then feeds out into a larger lake. But this area is actually, um, very weedy and marshy and you just kind of get these little slivers of reflection and that's what I'm trying to capture here. Since I have my sketch on my paper it's really easy to uh, be able to throw in reflections here and there. It just gives me a really nice guide. So even though it looks like a pretty rough sketch, it's actually quite helpful. There's no need for your sketch to be beautiful on your paper. It just needs to be informative and to uh, give you a good idea to where everything goes. And that's something else I want to talk about painting in plain air or outdoors is that you're probably not going to get as refined of results as you would if you were sitting in your comfy studio with all of your tools and trappings around. But you will get a very accurate um, depiction of color and you'll also have a better sense of the, um, the place where you're painting. Your memory of the place will be much better. So if you're going to go and work from photos later, you're going to have a better, um, a better sense of how things actually looked with the light. Now the light did change as I was working over that course of a half an hour, but um, you know, once you start down, you start mapping things out, you can keep pretty consistent. If you do decide to change something like in the, in the trees and in the scenery, you will have to be mindful of the reflections. So just make sure that um, if you started painting reflections and then you finished painting your your subject, just make sure that your reflections match. And if they don't, then, um, then you can adjust just by seeing, you know, just looking and seeing how things change. Uh, I like to rely on what I really see for reflections and I try not to guess because depending on the angle you're at, the angle that the, the sun's at, um, the elevation that you're standing or sitting at, they, all these different things have um, can affect how the reflections look. Now these trees far in the back, I'm trying to make them a little bit cooler and muted. So I used some uh, hooker's green and some ultramarine blue just to get this kind of dull, cool green. And into that, I'm adding some yellow ochre and um, some uh, gamboge for a warm yellow. 
I'm going to list the colors that I have in my travel palette in the video description. I choose colors that are non-toxic because when I'm painting out and about, I do tend to dump my dirty water. Now, there's such a minuscule amount of pigment in that water, but still, I want to be mindful of the, um, of the nature around me, and I want to make sure I'm not going to be adding anything that could harm it. Uh, it was really cute. While I was painting here, there was a little chipmunk that was kind of darting around the table because its little um, its little hole in the ground was in front of the table, and so it kept coming out and getting acorns and coming back with really fat cheeks and then hopping back into its hole to store them away for winter. I wish I had an extra camera that I could just have grabbed and gotten um, video of him, but I probably would have spooked him. He was not very shy with me just sitting there painting, but uh, that's neat. That's something you're not going to find in your studio. At least I hope you're not having chipmunks running around your studio anyway. I wanted to make sure that I got the texture and these muted colors far back in the scenery because it adds depth and it, um, it kind of um, sets the scene and fills it up so you can see that it's really a very pristine area. There's you know no buildings, there's um, nothing but a wildlife here, nature, and I just wanted to make sure it felt like you were in this stream, like you were you were there and you weren't being um, uh, harassed by any man-made buildings or anything. It's just such a beautiful, natural place that I wanted to capture. I also am using my paint to reserve some of the highlight areas. There are some areas with really kind of bright springy green foliage still. There's, uh, because of all of the water, and it hasn't gotten really, really cold yet, I think it's only dropped below freezing maybe a couple times so far this year. So I wanted to capture those bright spring greens while they're still around, because in another week or two, they'll probably all be really um, uh, kind of frosted and just kind of dried up and um, crinkly looking. So I wanted to grab that right now. This week here in uh, this part of Maine, which is uh, kind of mid-coast area, is peak foliage season. So it's just so gorgeous and I love to get out this time of year. And it's only a few days really where you have this peak foliage. It's always around um, Columbus Day or now Indigenous Peoples Day here in Maine. And it's a, just a gorgeous time to get out and, uh, and look at the leaves if you're around here. Uh, the real popular places in Maine are crowded like crazy, like Acadia National Park. Stuff like that is just mobbed with tourists, but you can find places off the beaten path like this and just really enjoy nature and enjoy the, um, the fall colors. I mean, even if you live up here and go to your backyard and enjoy the colors, it's, it's really magnificent. Um, really takes the sting out of the fact that the weather's going to get cold soon. I'm also throwing in some burnt sienna or transparent brown oxide. I do have transparent brown oxide in my palette right now and a bee has come over to investigate my painting setup. Um, I think it's because I probably have a, uh, a brand or two of paint that has uh, honey in it. Um, I'm just going to list the colors. I'm not going to be brand specific because I have refilled this palette so many times and um, you know I find any, any good quality brand of watercolor paint is going to be good. And you just spied me using a credit card scraper to scratch in some of the little details at the shoreline, those little re uh, reeds and grasses that, um, that kind of grow out right next to the water. Now I know I wanted to keep some nice crisp red. I'm using a mixture of um, quinacridone rose and vermilion, or actually it's pyrrole red, which is a nice warm red. I'm using a mixture of those two to get my reds in there, and then I am dabbing in some greens around them. And green and red are opposite, so when you put them next to each other, they make each other appear to be more vibrant. If you mix those two colors together, you'll get more of a brown neutralized dull color. So that's a neat thing about complementary colors. Um, they're opposite on the color wheel. They make each other look brighter, but if you mix them together, they neutralize. They make a natural shadow. So file that away. If you didn't know that already, uh, file that away because it's very useful when you're making natural shadows for things. Now I had to tip my paper up a little bit, and you can see the sun is out now. The sun is really bright. Um, I needed to get a nice, crisp, uh, darker reflection and shadow at the bottom of the waterline here where it's casting this direct reflection and uh, making the, the water appear darker. And I also wanted to break apart the kind of um, 
foliage in front of the trees because it's kind of dark at the base of the trees but you've got this brightly lit foliage underneath so I'm using some darker color to break that up and then the credit card scraper again to get those little details of shrubs and weeds and whatnot. And now that it's back on my easel, um, luckily my paper is shaded because if my paper was in the bright sunlight, it would my eyes would be so tired and it would be really hard to get accurate values. And I find that if you press really hard with a credit card scraper or the back of a paintbrush handle, you can squeegee out the paint and get some really nice like birch tree trunks in there, which um, to be honest, I didn't really see birch trees over there, but I wanted that spark of white, so I left it that way. I do put some darker tree trunks in later, but um, sometimes you gotta add a little bit um, from your imagination and your preferences to uh, enhance a picture. And there are birch trees around here, so it, it's all good, it works. <laughs> And I realized that my foliage in the background needs to be a little bit darker to push it back, a little bit darker and cooler, and so that's what I'm doing there. And now I am just carving out the trees that are on the left-hand side of the stream. Now I did compress the scene a little bit. I do tend to do that a lot. Um, and I know that's I, I, because I wanted stuff from both sides in the, um, in the composition. And I also wanted to get that zigzag of, of water reflection going so um, you know sometimes you alter things a bit and also one of the reasons I pulled the trees in a little bit there is because when I put my reflections down I wasn't very oh I didn't pay attention to my sketch and so I had reflections for those orange and red trees out into the water a little bit too far so I figured oh, I'm just gonna pull those trees in so um, so you know if you need to make a change make a change you are the creator of this world obviously you are capturing nature and that's just that ultramarine blue i'm just kind of poking in some sky here and there so that it can show through the trees and then as it mixes with the green it becomes um just thick foliage this is the sedunkadunk fishway in orrington maine close to my uh, home it's um actually i should do a little paint air workshop there because that would be perfect this is a great little place you can grab pizza like right around the corner if you follow that path we were walking on at the beginning of the video it takes you to a great pizza place <laughs> i'm telling you man man the light w the way life should be guys you've got this and then you got pizza right around the corner can you beat it i don't i don't think you can i really don't well, you could beat it if, the, if there wasn't so much darn cold weather and snow in the winter, <laughs> but some people like that, so, um, so hey, I guess, uh, <laughs> I guess that's okay. And right here, I'm using this flat brush. Now, these brushes, I got these at Jerry's Autorama, and it was this weird clearance product. They were made by the company Best, B-E-S-T-E, -E, and there were, it was a set of three brushes. They were double-ended. They were flats on one side and round on the other, and they got kind of skinny in the middle. And I'm like, well, I can't set this in my jar to store them. I'm going to damage one side or the other. I don't store my brushes flat. So what I did was I took a saw, and I just sawed them in the middle, and I, um, I sanded it. And so then I had six little travel brushes from that set of brushes, and it was on clearance for a few bucks, so it was a great deal. I don't know if they still make them or not, but, um, you know, if you need travel brushes and you don't want to go buy any, or the travel brushes you want are expensive, just go saw off the brushes you have that you don't need for your in-studio painting, and it works great. Now, this is a uh, purchased travel brush. Um, this is one of the pseudo sables from Cheap Joe's, and uh, honestly, I have to say the number 12 round, this is the number 4, I grabbed the smaller one just because I was doing smaller branches, but the number 12 round that I used at the beginning of the video actually has such a razor sharp point, it will do pretty much everything that the whole set would do. So I would recommend just buying the number 12 round because it's got such a great point on it if you're looking for a travel brush. The uh, cap extends the brush so it's like a regular length, but then it protects the tip of the brush in your bag. So um, as long as you're careful to put the brush tips on, the brush covers on, they work fantastic. Um, but since I had the other exercises, I figured I might as well use them. Now I'm putting a few little lily pads in the uh, water towards the foreground a bit because I like to do some detailed work closer to the bottom of my paper because if it's closer to the bottom of my paper, it's closer to the viewer. The further away from the horizon line you are, the closer it is to the viewer. So by putting in some crisp details here like these little reeds, the um, lily pads with their little shadows next to them, and I'm going to put some other little grasses in there. It just gives you that sense of depth and scale and that's why you know some paintings look flat because they lack that and then some paintings seem to have, even though they're small, they have a lot of depth. Like I've got the those far away cool um, foliage way way in the background and then I've got these sharp 
uh, grasses and weeds in the foreground and that just helps give depth to the scene. Now I could go in with a white gel pen and add some sparkles in the water, but really um, it wasn't really that. The water wasn't like glistening like that. It wasn't sparkling, even though my dog was actually uh, playing in the in the boat launch area and making some little ripples. You really couldn't see it so far, um, this far away on the, um, on the painting. And now that I'm done for the day, I'm going to clean up my palette. I'm just going to wash my brushes in the clean side of the water so that I can put them away because my I always wash my brushes in the dirty side then use the other side for clean water and now I'm just dipping a rag in some clean water and wiping out my palette so it'll be ready for the next time I go to paint. I don't save my mixes because the chances are I need the same mixes again are very slim and then I just wipe out the inside of the buckets and close it up. I really love this palette. It's my favorite travel palette. It's just so handy and then you can put in whatever you want and uh, I've got this little wallet that my little travel brushes come in if you decide to get the full set that's what it comes in but honestly the number 12 works fa fantastic and uh, yeah, I put everything back in my bag and I was ready to go so it doesn't have to be a big ordeal you know you could take you know your lunch hour and take like half of your lunch hour and go do a little plein air painting somewhere it's just handy. The bag I have is by Grumbacher. I've got it probably 15 or 20 years ago. They don't make it anymore, but it's really uh, it's really a great bag because it's got a little stool that's built in. You might be able to find something like it at a like an army surplus store or a like um, military supply store or something like that. Uh, but I don't know where to find that exact bag because it's discontinued. I wish they still made it. And they're taking off the tape. You get that really nice white frame and I just think it looks so fantastic. And there is the actual photograph, the actual scene. I'll put that up on my blog. And um, it was just so much fun to, uh, to paint with you today. If you'd like to see some more paintings like this, then let me know and uh, maybe we'll take you on another art adventure. Right, Penny? What do you think? <laughs> and that's all for today. Please let me know what you thought in the comments below and I'll leave you with a few more seconds of walking through the woods on this gorgeous Maine fall afternoon. See you next time. I think they'll probably paint from here.